Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Donna Messini on uh, behalf of the President's Office and um, come on in. On behalf of the President's Office and the English Department and the MFA program, um, all my wonderful colleagues here, I want to welcome you to this uh, reading, Mary Shebist. Um, I want to mention what's the next reading, November 28th. Ayanna Mathis will be reading November 28th. And are the rest of the readings listed in the program? Oh, it's the last one. Okay. I'll remember. Um, okay. Um, it is difficult to get the news from poems. Yet, men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. We need to amend William Carlos Williams's line. He says, men, let's include women, the rest of the human and other animals, trees and birds, wolves, grass, the planet, our heartbreaking, beautiful, embattled universe. The true in poetry, the great recently deceased Louise Glick says, is felt as insight. It is very rare, she continues, but beside it, other poems seem merely intelligent commentary. Some days I'm so grateful to poetry, poetry which allows us to look at or simply be in this world in all its complexity, poetry which can companion us in our bewilderment, hold the terrible and the beautiful, the unbearable, unfathomable, the glorious, the sacred, help us live in our helplessness with our aspirations. Poetry with its ability to dwell in possibility and uncertainty. One of the many things I love about Mary Shebist's poems is that they have this capacity to dwell in the uncertain. They seem to thrive on bewilderment. And yet there's a feeling too in the poems of how much easier it would be not to, to have a fixed story, to have certainty. Hmm, even intelligent commentary. And yet, I had a happy idea, she says in a poem called Happy Ideas, that what I do not understand is more real than what I do. I love this, this insight, the ambiguous final verb. I also love the way the thought continues in the next line. And then the happier idea to buckle myself. There it is, that grasping after fixity. Then the line turns and the thought continues into two blue velvet shoes. Let's hear it again. I had the happy idea that what I do not understand is more real than what I do. And then the happier idea to buckle myself into two blue velvet shoes. What can I say? This says so much to me about Mary Shebist's imagination, how she will manage into the richest metaphysical considerations to slip in, say, a velvet bikini. Sometimes we read a poet and experience an immediate excitement. That particular imagination or way of writing out of experience thrills us. A mind in action, we call it. Their thoughts and thinking, their negotiations with silence are often what return us to the poets we return to again and again. Poems that return us to our own silences. I said mind, I said thoughts and thinking, but the moving mind, embodied is what I mean. What mind moves us through the body of the poem? Eros, words made, well, incarnate. I don't remember when I first read Incarnadine, which is odd, but it seems to me I have never stopped reading it. Mary Shebist changed the way I look at something central to my life. Let me explain. I grew up with Mary. Not, not this Mary, this Mary I just met, um, this Mary. I grew up with this Mary. I lived with the idea of her culled from stories and prayers and dressing up as her each Halloween, Catholic school, no saint named Donna. After the holy cards, I came to know the many paintings, Madonna's, of course, version after version of Mary's encounter with the angel, finger in a book or book tented, pushed aside, a woman, Blessed, soon to be a mother, 
Even as I grew into a more dimensional way of looking at her, Mary remained a woman. A woman interrupted. What she missed with all her versions and revisions helped me see was a girl. A girl interrupted, or rather girls interrupted, for in Shebist's imagination, the Annunciation becomes Annunciations. I think I see Annunciations everywhere, one poem says, in a book that interrogates the various and surprising encounters the word covers. But my favorite moment of Mary comes a little bit later in her story, after that first encounter. Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. Pondered them in her heart. I love those words. Mary was a contemplative. Mary is a contemplative. Mary had already said her beautiful Magnificat, so Mary was also a poet. Mary is a poet. Ponder. How else to deal with mystery? Shebist in her poems allows mystery to remain mystery. Her poems resist explanation, refuse to be pinned down. And one reason I think we read the works of contemplatives is that they allow us to participate in the mystery, to enter our own silences, our own interior castles, to surrender to our clouds of unknowing. Mostly here, I've been talking about incarnadine, or incarnadine as I say it, incarnadine as Mary pronounces it, a book that has made Mary Shebist one of those poets you want to follow to see where they go next, what she has pondered in her heart, waited, sat quietly with, finding its way into language to come to us as her next poems. And that is a happy idea. The other happy idea is that you can read all about her many impressive awards and publications in your program, which is on your seat, and that you can ask her some questions and buy her books after she reads. Mary Shebist, welcome to Hunter. Pentacle. In the beginning, God said light, and there was light. Now God says, give them a little theatrical lighting, and they're happy. And we are. So many of us dressing each morning, testing endless combinations, becoming in our mirrors more ourselves, imagining in an entrance the ecstatic weight of human eyes. Now that the sun is shearing toward us, what is left but to let it close in for our close-up? Let us really feel how good it feels to be still in it, making every kind of self that can be looked at. God, let us be your bright accomplices. God, here are our shining spines. Let there be no more dreams of being more than a beginning. Let it be that to be is to be backlit, and then to be only that light. Thank you, Donna. Um, thank you, Hunter, for having me, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge that there's um, a lot of suffering right now, and it does feel strange to be up here reading. Um, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, one of the um, guiding lights of my of this last book, Incarnadine, is um, from Simone Weig. And uh, she says, the mysteries of faith are degraded if they are made into an object of affirmation and negation, when in reality, they should be an object of contemplation.
Um, this is um, in that sense, um, a poem that uh, is wrestling with the legacy of this figure of Mary. Well, Mary, who mattered to me, gone or asleep among fruits, spilled in ash and dust, I did not leave you. Even now, I can't keep from composing you, limbs and blue cloak, cloak and soft hands. I sleep to the sound of your name. I say, there is no Mary except the word Mary, no trace on the dust of my pillow slip. I only dream of your ankles brushed by dark violets, of honeybees above you murmuring into a crown. Antique queen, the night dreams on. Here are the pears I have washed for you. Here the heavy winged doves asleep by the hyacinth. Here I am, having bathed carefully in the syllables of your name, in the air and the sea of them, the sharp scent of their sea foam. What is the matter with me? Mary, what word, what dust can I look behind? I carried you a long way into my mirror, believing you would carry me back out. Mary, I'm still for you. I'm still a numbness for you. Uh, and this is Annunciation under Erasure, um, trying to find a new, a new version of the Annunciation scene between Gabrielle and Mary. And he came to her and said, the Lord is troubled in mind. Be afraid, Mary. The holy will overshadow you. Therefore, be nothing. Be impossible. And Mary said, and the angel departed from her. Uh, this is another contemplation on the same scene, uh, this time between, um, uh, this time it's framed as girls overheard while assembling a puzzle. And uh, it imagines that a bunch of girls are uh, putting together a puzzle of this annunciation scene between Mary and the angel literally puzzling. <laughs> over it, trying to figure out uh, what is this, uh, this iconography, uh, this, uh, this image, what is this legacy? How are we supposed to understand and talk about it? And how does it, uh, how does it matter? Um, uh, there's, um, uh, a, a tiny poem I love from Louise Glick, um, uh, Donna mentioned, um, the poet uh, who died last week. I've been thinking about her a lot. She has this little poem called Telemachus's Detachment. And it simply goes, when I was a child looking at my parents' lives, you know what I thought? I thought, heartbreaking. 
now I think heartbreaking, but also insane, <laughs> also very funny. And uh, I think that uh, there's some correspondence between that and the sort of uh, ways that different uh, myths and inheritances parent us. Um, and I think this one uh, has a similar spirit. Um, it's an abecedarian, which means just that it begins with the letter A and the next line begins with B. So it, it sort of is as a kind of alphabet in terms of what kind of language are these girls being initiated into and now participating in initiating themselves into. Girls overheard while assembling a puzzle. Are you sure this blue is the same as the blue over there? The, this wall's like the bottom of a pool. It's color, I mean. I need a darker two-piece this summer, the kind with elastic at the waist so it actually fits. I can't find her hands. Where does this gold go? It's like the angels giving her a little piece of honeycomb to eat. I don't see why God doesn't just come down and kiss her himself. Is this the, the red of that lipstick we saw at the mall? This piece of her neck could fit into the light part of the sky. I think this is a piece of water. What kind of queen? You mean right here? And are we supposed to believe she can suddenly talk angel? Who thought this stuff up? I wish I had a velvet bikini. That's the flower, that flower is the color of the veins in my grandmother's hands. I wish we could walk into that garden and pick an x-ray to float on. Yeah, I do too. I'd say a zillion yeses to anyone for that. Uh, this also involves a girl. I think I was thinking a lot about girls through these poems, thinking about, as Donna cited, uh, Mary's young age. Um, this is called On Wanting to Tell About a Girl Eating Fish Eyes, and it takes its occasion as... Um, uh, the night um, my uh, friend, the poet, uh, Donald Justice, died, I uh, was to dinner at a friend's house, and he served whole grilled fish for supper. And his daughter was about four years old at the time, and she loved eating the fish out of, eating the eyes out of the fish. So she sort of went from lap to lap during the dinner party. Uh, eating the eyes out of everyone's fish. And uh, there was something about how alive that was that I really wanted to connect it uh, to my friend who had just died. And the great thing about poems is you get to talk to the dead. On wanting to tell about a girl eating fish eyes, how her loose curls float above the silver fish as she leans in to pluck its eyes. You died just hours ago. Not suddenly, no. You'd been dying so long, nothing looked like itself. From your window, fishermen swirled sequins. Fishnets entangled the moon. Now the dark rain looks like dark rain. Only the wine shimmers with candlelight. 
I refill the glasses as we raise a toast to you, as so-and-so's daughter's elfin, jittery as a sparrow, slides into another lap to eat another pair of slippery eyes with her soft fingers, fingers rosier each time for being chewed a little. If only I could go to you, revive you. You must be a little alive still. I'd like to put the girl in your lap. She's almost feverishly warm and she weighs hardly anything. I want to show you how she relishes each eye, to show you her greed for them. She is placing one on her tongue, bright as a polished coin. What do they taste like, I ask. Twisting in my lap, she leans back sleepily. They taste like eyes, she says. I want to read a poem that I think I couldn't have written without Louise Glick. Uh, this is called Cry Light. We like loss to be quiet. Outside, flowers with lemon-stained throats smack noiselessly at the breeze, though their mouths don't close, no, they cower to closing. When I speak, my voice speaks over me, its light notes, ligatures, to make you calm again. To relieve each sound of its wail, you knock, I exhale. We like loss to be quiet. This entails no loveliness. If I loved you less, I would be aggressively lovely. Outside, each flower makes a face. My face makes faces, but each looks, you say, the same. What stupor kissed me, revoked me, left me bent? Is there a scent in me? We like loss to be quiet. Um, uh, this poem, uh, the occasion is, um, uh, after, um, a long marriage, um, seeing my ex for the first time after a long time of not seeing him. I was wrestling with the lilac, reaching up to bend down its branches so I could clip them. The bush far taller than me, still fragrant, leaves half dead, never uglier. I was half inside it. At the sound of him making the sound of my name, the lilac shook. Not having heard him crossing the backyard, some part of it in my hands, one holding the warm plastic handles of my blades. At the sound of his voice, certain neurons lit up in me, others at the sight of him. The way they moved in me may have looked something like the meaningless gestures he made with his hands. Any two who share a bed don't mean to sink their breathing or the rhythms of their hearts beating. The brain does that. To feel it is safe enough to sleep, it tries to believe the brain next to it is the same brain. 
as if the rhythm of the brain's sameness is the brain's sameness. The way he seemed to lean against the air, did I do that? I felt the lilac at my back. The lilac was not a god, even had it moved covetously toward him, it could not ignite me. Just by the pattern of veins that run through him, I could, I thought, recognize any part of him, recognize his veins as his veins, which is not true. Once I stood by him, now I stood by the lilac. The indolent light expanded over the heap of branches. What happens to a story after everyone cuts themselves out? The nymph who became a lilac didn't escape the god. Moving his lips over the branch, he cut Kissing it, breathing into it, he didn't mean to make a note, then blew again into his instrument. To say I felt hollow, though my brain felt folded over, full of surfaces. To say my head felt soft. Here is what I know of my mind. It is not kind. We spent decades in the presence of each other's faces. What that erases. As a child, he lived by a certain river. As a child, I lived by another. It was the most private thing in us. Who are you, a voice asks, to write about anything but silence? It is only yours to write that. We stood and talked by the lilac. The more we talked, the more I wanted not to remember. I wanted. Overhead, robins and sparrows and. I wanted, and therefore. My brain inflamed with saying, who was he to me? A blossom is not a brain. A lilac blossom is almost entirely unlike a human brain in its dimensions and its color and the quality of its softness when it is alive. Two more. The lushness of it. It's not that the octopus wouldn't love you. Not that it wouldn't reach for you with each of its tapering arms. You'd be as good as anyone, I think, to an octopus. But the creatures of the sea, unlike the sea, might think about themselves and you. Keep on floating there, cradled, unable to burn. Abandon yourself to the sway, the ruffled eddies. Abandon your heavy legs to the floating meadows of seaweed and feel the bloom of photoplankton, spindrift, sea spray, barnacles. In the dark benthic realm, the slippery nectin glide over the abyssal plains, and as you float, you can feel that upwelling of cold, deep water touch the skin stretched over your spine. No, 
It's not that the octopus wouldn't love you. If it touched, if it tasted you, each of its three hearts would turn red. Will theologians of any confession refute me? Not the blue cap salmon, not its dotted head. And I'll end where Donna began with happy ideas. Um, this began with uh, Duchamp's wheel. That's here, right? And is that in the MoMA? I think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, Duchamp's wheel. Um, uh, and he, uh, he said about it, I had the happy idea to fasten a bicycle wheel to a kitchen stool and watch it turn. And I liked the idea of a happy idea. I had the happy idea to suspend some blue globes in the air and watch them pop. I had the happy idea to put my little copper horse on the shelf so we could stare at each other all evening. I had the happy idea to create a void in myself, then to call it natural, then to call it supernatural. I had the happy idea to wrap a blue scarf around my head and spin. I had the happy idea that somewhere a child was being born who was nothing like Helen or Jesus except in the sense of changing everything. I had the happy idea that someday I would find both pleasure and punishment, that I would know them and feel them, and that, until I did, it would be almost as good to pretend. I had the happy idea to call myself happy. I had the happy idea that the dog digging a hole in the yard in the twilight had his nose deep in mold life. I had the happy idea that what I do not understand is more real than what I do. And then the happier idea to buckle myself into two blue velvet shoes. I had the happy idea to polish the reflecting glass and say hello to my own blue soul. Hello, blue soul. Hello. It was my happiest idea. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Um, that was just beautiful. Um, we're going to open the floor up to questions. Uh, we'll probably just do two or three for time. Um, but if you do have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over to you. Hi. Um, I was wondering about um, some of the forms that you have in um, in Carnadine and whether you find yourself returning to them even now after, you know, years after this book, um, whether as like a jumping off point for other poems or a first draft or something that you just want to keep working with. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, I'm trying to think about specific forms that I'm still working on. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think for me, the, the thing that is most primary to poetic form is the line and how that works with silence and breath. I mean, I think about the Latin spiritus and the very a very long sense that the breath is related to the spirit, right? Inspiration. Um, and so um, that for me is always sort of the primary thing I tend to come back to. That said, uh, I think the, uh, the prose poem, it was the first time I ever tried that in that last collection. And that, you know, even as I say that, uh, has allowed a different kind of gathering that I'm 
also very interested in. So that has continued uh, as well. Yeah. Um, who and what are your biggest poetic influences? So many. Uh, I think um, Yeats was a big uh, haunting <laughs> of this collection. But, uh, you know, a lot of the people that have been with me for a long time, include uh, George Herbert and John Donne and Dickinson and um, so many. Uh, <laughs> um, Charles Wright. Um, Glick really, uh, she really did matter to me a lot as uh when I was first learning to to listen to poems, um, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, Darwish, um, uh, I always I always have a head swirling full of names at this moment, but yeah, those are a few. I have a much more pedestrian question, um, but wanted to know about the poem to Gabriela de Dink, Donkey Sanctuary, because that one has stuck with me since the book came out. Uh, anything in particular you want to know about it? Uh, yeah, I was always just struck about like what inspired that, if it was a, a certain circumstance of yeah. like uh, a real based in some part of your your personal history. I don't know. I always love that story. I, yeah. So. Well, I did not come to the Annunciation scene by accident. Uh, you know, I grew up with the namesake of Mary and my uh, oldest childhood friend is Gabriella. And I went, uh, I grew up attending the Church of the Annunciation that was always in front of me. And I was with Gabriella when I went to Italy and the Uffizi and saw the sort of myriad of annunciations that started inspiring the sort of imagination of the book. So um, with that one, you know, she, she really was in Spain at a donkey sanctuary. And uh, I was writing to her and so we were playing with it i mean for you know primarily i think art is play right and trying to find new possibilities within something that no longer feels always generative and so um uh so yeah it literally began as that and i liked the idea of reversing Instead of uh, Gabriel being the one to address Mary, having um, a Mary <laughs> addressing uh, a Gabriella. So it's sort of um, uh, putting it in verse, uh, inversing it in verse <laughs> or prose. Um, and yeah, that one is is meaningful to me as well. I mean, that one is partly why the prose form started feeling generative to me again, that um, it sort of reached that sort of um, moment of, uh, you know, I want what I've always wanted. What I want is to be changed. And having it in the context of addressing a friend, I think is part of what allowed that sort of insight 
to come through, right? Sometimes I think we are willing to tell our friends things that we wouldn't know how to tell ourselves if we weren't trying to stretch and communicate ourselves to somebody we loved. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it also, um, uh, the the room of that poem offered me something. I mean, I really like Charles Wright's idea that, um, you know, art tends toward the certainty of bringing things together. You know, this is like this, right? Life is like a box of, box of chocolates. <laughs> Whatever seems easy to sort of just say this is like this. And he said the artist's job is to keep them apart, like have them in tension, but not have them be just equal signs, letting the synapse spark. And I think that one gave me more room and that way, or I experienced that in it. Is, is there a particular, like a theological, contemplative writer that's important, kind of essential to to your writing with, with poetry, or do you tend to keep that separate? Mm. I think the honest answer is my theologians are poets. So. 